Good morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm Emily Ponchel with the Newberry Library. Thank you for joining us for today's Colonial History Lecture with Eric Hinderocker, who will speak on wars of independence and revolution in the Americas, 1775 to 1825. Our co-sponsors for the Colonial History Lecture Series are the Society of Colonial Wars in the State of Illinois and the History Department at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. The Society for Colonial Wars is a national historic and genealogical organization comprising more than 4,000 members who trace their ancestry to a soldier, sailor, or government official who served in America between 1607 and 1775. Its mission is to perpetuate the memory of those who served, as well as the events of the colonial era and to educate the public about the period by sponsoring lectures and publications and offering financial support to colonial era researchers and authors. Dr. Hinderocker's talk is the 11th in the Colonial History Lecture Series since this partnership began in 2016. The Newberry Library supports and inspires research, teaching, and learning in the humanities. Since our founding in 1887, the Newberry has remained dedicated to deepening our collective understanding of ourselves and the world around us. We connect researchers and visitors with our collection in the Newberry's reading rooms, exhibition galleries, program spaces, classrooms, and online digital resources. The Newberry reading rooms and exhibition galleries are now open to visitors with no appointment necessary Tuesday through Saturday. Our Rosenberg Bookshop is open Wednesday through Saturday and online anytime. Visit newberry.org to learn more about our collections and exhibitions, our many digital resources and online classes, and our virtual and in-person free public programs. I also encourage you to follow the Newberry on social media for more opportunities to engage with our collections, our staff, and stories that bridge the past and present. Today's program is one example of the Newberry Library's civic commitment to public education and intellectual engagement, bringing together communities of scholars, students, and the public to discuss ideas that matter in our world today is central to the Newberry's mission. During the program, please enter your questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comments section if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube. As time permits, Dr. Hinderocker will respond. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Eric Hinderocker is Distinguished Professor of History at the University of Utah. His scholarship focuses on relations between Europeans and Native Americans, the nature of early modern empires, and comparative colonization. His books include Elusive Empires, Constructing Colonialism in the Ohio Valley, 1673 to 1800, The Two Hendricks, Unraveling a Mohawk Mystery, and Boston's Massacre. Now I will hand things over to Dr. Hinderocker. Thanks very much, Emily, and um, thank you to uh, all the Newbury staff that's been involved with setting this up. Thanks especially to Karen and Philip for their kind invitation to what is now been a, a long delayed lecture. Um, I'm honored to be part of this series uh, and uh, to be speaking with you all this morning. And I particularly want to just say thank you to the audience members who are taking time out on a Saturday morning to, uh, to listen to this lecture on wars of independence and revolution in the Americas, 1775 to 1825 with an emphasis, as the subtitle suggests, on structures, continuities, and comparisons. And I guess as a starting point, it's worth asking why we should think about the American Revolution in the context of other wars of independence, liberation, and revolution in the Americas. Or to turn the question around, why think of the independence of Mexico, or Haiti, or Argentina, alongside the independence of the United States? This talk draws a uh, on a book project that I'm working on with my colleague in colonial Latin American history at the University of Utah, Rebecca Horn. The book traces the development of the Americas from 1492 to independence. And this um, is drawn from the last chapter 
<clears throat> the goal of the book project is to see the colonization of the Americas as a single story, a highly differentiated yet coherent story characterized by parallel lines of development and ongoing patterns of entanglement. We're far from the first scholars to try to see the Americas whole and to conceptualize colonization as a single differentiated yet coherent phenomenon. The distinguished genealogy of this effort is usually traced back to the work of Herbert Bolton, who you see here on your slide, the immensely influential historian from the University of California, Berkeley, whose own work emphasized continuities in the European colonization of the Americas, and who trained many graduate students to explore various topics that highlighted those continuities, especially borderlands history. Bolton's essential idea, as you can see in the title of this AHA, uh, essay, The Epic of Greater America, has inspired both support and criticism for many decades. We're mindful of Bolton as a forebear of our own pro project, but we depart from his emphases and interpretive frameworks in important ways. Though the so-called Bolton thesis has framed efforts to talk about the colonization of the Americas for nearly a century, it has earned, it, it, it has exerted relatively little influence on comparative interpretations of the American Revolution. Much more influential than Bolton in this regard has been R. R. Palmer, who first explored in detail what he called the age of democratic revolution in a two volume work that appeared in the late 1950s and early 1960s. In seeking to understand the larger impact of the American revolution, Palmer turned to Europe. The framing ideas that shaped the creation of the United States, he argued, were European ideas, critiques, of the principles of monarchy and hereditary power that still structured Europe's political institutions in the 18th century. Palmer contended that those critiques were especially salient in Britain's American colonies. They shaped their independence movement and then rebounded back across the Atlantic to inspire widespread political reforms. His two volume work considered the relationship of the American Revolution to the British Isles, France, Sweden, the Habsburg Empire, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Belgium, Poland, Russia, Italy, and Germany, but offered no sustained attempt to place it in conversation with events elsewhere in the Western Hemisphere. This is not to say that scholars have entirely neglected comparisons and connections among the various independence movements in the Americas. To take just a couple of examples, Lester Langley's book length effort to bring these wars together is a notable example, but for all its strengths, it is long on narrative exposition and short on clear analytical takeaways. Janet Pulaski's recent work on revolution in the Atlantic world expands R.R. Palmer's contexts to include Haiti and Sierra Leone, but remarkably has nothing to say about Simone Bolivar or any other figure from Mesoamerica or the South American mainland. There's a good reason why Latin America often falls away in these comparative and transnational analyses. Simply put, it is immensely complicated. By the late 18th century, Latin America included three broad regions, the islands of the Caribbean, Brazil, and mainland Spanish America, the mainland Spanish America, including both uh, Mesoamerica and uh, South America. Each of these regions had its own trajectory toward independence, and each was quite complicated in its own right. I'll have something to say about each of those regions later, but for now, I'll note that even just focusing on mainland Spanish America, independence movements unfolded across two decades or more in processes that were often halting, ambivalent, and disconnected. For that matter, independence in British America was also more complex than we often make it out to be. In the United States, we often conveniently forget that Great Britain had 28 American colonies, not 13. And in the British case too, independence movements fragmented the empire and produced complicated and ambivalent narratives. It's not my intention in this talk to narrate the many complicated pathways toward independence in the Americas, or to dwell on the complexities and ambivalences that were part of all these movements. Instead, I wanna argue in a fairly schematic way that three centuries of European activities in the Western hemisphere created conditions which shaped the prospects for independence everywhere. I wanna highlight the legacies of colonization throughout the hemisphere and suggest commonalities that transcend the boundaries between Anglo, Spanish, Portuguese, and French colonies. The pressures of the late 18th century and early 19th century fragmented 
every European empire in the Americas except one. Portuguese Brazil remained intact. The colonies of France, Spain, and Great Britain all spun off in different directions in response to the imperial crises of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. The differences among them were due as much to the particular geographic, demographic, and economic characteristics of each colony as they were to the distinctive political inheritances they received from their hearth countries. As a starting point for this consideration of the wars of independence and revolution, let's think about the colonies that didn't revolt. For this purpose, I'm gonna begin by focusing on the colonies of Great Britain. There were 28 British colonies in the Western hemisphere, 15 of which chose to remain under crown control. Eight of those 15 were island colonies. Jamaica, Barbados, the Leeward Islands, Grenada and Tobago, St. Vincent, Dominica, Bermuda, and the Bahamas. Seven were on the mainland or immediately adjacent to it, East and West Florida, Nova Scotia, Quebec, St. John's, Newfoundland, and Rupert's Land. Essentially, these 18 colonies were of two types. They were either too undeveloped or isolated for independence, or especially in the case of island colonies like Jamaica and Barbados, they were too wealthy, too racially imbalanced and too dependent on the support of British arms to risk it. In these respects, British, Britain's island colonies were like the wealthy staple producing plantation colonies of other European powers. In fact, throughout this era, only one sugar island achieved independence through war. That was the French colony of Saint-Domingue, which subsequently stood as a watchword and a warning to slave-owning Creole elites everywhere in the Americas. I'm gonna use this term Creole and Creole elites throughout this talk, um, and I'm using it in the sense that Latin Americanists use it referring to American-born European-descended people. Um, so um, the back to Saint-Domingue, its independence movement originated in a pushback by free people of color against new restrictions on their status in the colony. It gained force and momentum from the unfolding revolution in France, and it completely escaped the control of the island's planter class when military leaders armed and led the enslaved to take over the colony. It resulted in the creation of Haiti, the only black republic in the Americas. For slave owners throughout the Western hemisphere, the Haitian revolution and the black republic it created was their worst nightmare. It was also atypical of an island plantation colony. In colonies like Jamaica and Barbados, and also Cuba and Puerto Rico, the great planters had too much to lose to risk the kind of popular mobilization that a war of independence required. They relied fundamentally on metropolitan institutions, armies and navies foremost among them to sustain their power. The Stamp Act was a grievance in Jamaica every bit as much as it was in Massachusetts, but the reaction in the island colony was more measured, tempered perhaps by the still fresh memory of Tacky's revolt and especially dangerous and threatening slave rebellion that had been suppressed in Jamaica only a few years earlier. To maintain control of the island, Planters understood the importance of the British Army to help suppress the slave uprisings and the British Navy to protect the colony from European rivals. These island colonies were immensely valuable and doubly vulnerable, and that made for a governing class that was inherently conservative, however much they wanted to resist metropolitan revenue measures. This relationship to metropolitan authority varied throughout the hemisphere. Each of the European colonizing powers implemented reforms in the 18th century that strengthened the metropole and correspondingly threatened or weakened the Creole elite. Colonial responses to metropolitan reforms varied depending on various things, but depending especially on the demographic and economic foundations of each colony. In British mainland North America, leadership in the independence movement was taken by the two oldest most well-established colonies, Massachusetts Bay and Virginia. In Spanish America, it was the reverse. Independence movements started at the margins in some of the most recently occupied regions of development and moved only slowly and fitfully toward the older core regions of colonization in Peru and Mexico. In the rest of this talk, I wanna puzzle through this difference. Why did the leaders of Massachusetts Bay and Virginia resort to independence? 
And why, on the other hand, were leaders in Peru and Mexico comparatively reluctant to pursue it? Virginia and Massachusetts were dissimilar colonies in many ways, <clears throat> but they had in common the fact that they'd been around for a century and a half, more or less, by the time of the independence movement. They had deeply rooted Creole elites who had achieved a substantial degree of stability, yet their circumstances were also precarious in the sense that no one in these colonies had ascribed privileges in the manner of the English nobility. They operated in a competitive world and in both Massachusetts and Virginia, the line between success and failure, even for the colony's wealthiest families was a fine one. They were led by people who were confident of their abilities and station, but also sharply defensive of their interests. The imperial reforms implemented by Great Britain after the Seven Years' War were an affront to their material concerns as much as they were to their ideological commitments. Massachusetts leaders had little reason to fear that the pursuit of independence would disrupt their social order. A relatively egalitarian and open society comprised almost entirely of free white yeoman families and in the colony's few small urban centers, middling merchants and artisans, its members were largely of one mind when they considered their prospects for independence. There was no large bound or immiserated population whose interests were opposed to theirs. Most Massachusetts communities could unite around the independence movement relatively easily. This is not to say that there were no loyalists in the colony because obviously there were, but they were not drawn from any particular rank in society and they did not constitute a social force that was sufficiently powerful to threaten the community leaders who were pushing for independence. Those leaders could draw on English Republican and Commonwealth ideology, ideas that were foundational to the establishment of Massachusetts Bay and that still resonated with a majority of resident, residents. Undertaking independence was perhaps less risky for Massachusetts leaders than it was for the Creole elite anywhere else in the Americas. Virginia was a significantly different story, different enough that it demands an explanation. To put it simply, why was Virginia more like Massachusetts Bay than Jamaica? Like Jamaica, it had substantial wealth in slaves. Like Jamaica, its economy was fundamentally dependent on its relationship with Great Britain, where planters sold their tobacco crops. Like Jamaica, Virginia leaders had to worry about the way independence might disrupt the social order and even trigger a rebellion of the enslaved. But Virginia also resembled Massachusetts in important ways. Its Creole elite, like that of Massachusetts Bay, was deeply invested in the English Republican tradition. Political ideas mattered to the leadership class of both colonies. But that was true in Jamaica as well. Beyond that, Virginia did not have the same vulnerability to external invasion that the island colonies did. And the proportion of enslaved people in the population, about 40%, was much less frightening to planters than in a colony like Jamaica, which was 95% black. Moreover, in contrast to the sugar economy, which was booming in the 1760s and 1770s, tobacco was a failing crop for Virginia planters, driving them into debt as it delivered uncertain returns. Throughout the Tidewater regions, planters were beginning to experiment with mixed agriculture as they were moving away from tobacco in the years just before independence. In the context of a post Seven Years War depression and credit crunch, Britain's revenue measures, the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, the Townsend duties were considerably more threatening to the economic well-being of Virginia than they were to that of Jamaica, where planters also resisted taxation, but by contrast, easily bore the expense and ultimately considered it a fair trade for the protection they received. So one way to think about the prospect of independence is to say that the colonies of British North America fell along a spectrum. At one end of that spectrum stood Massachusetts Bay, whose leaders had little to fear from independence. Economically, their colony was marginal to British interests and they gained little of direct value from Great Britain. Socially and politically, their colony's population was relatively homogenous and like-minded, and the nature of their political community was unproblematic. When they advocated for a Republican revolution that would replace monarchical power with a more direct and democratic form of rule, they were advocating for a system that looked very similar to the one 
that was already in place. In colonial Massachusetts, essentially all white heads of household were empowered to vote and the town meeting system assured that politics had functioned in a more or less consensual way for a very long time. Colonies like New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania were much less unified than Massachusetts Bay was, but their Creole elites did not face any obvious social or political obstacles to independence. The Creole elites in Maryland and Virginia faced a different calculus in two important ways. First, they relied on a trade in tobacco with Great Britain for much of their overseas income. And second, they each had a large minority of enslaved laborers to contend with. These considerations were not enough to offset the radical uh, political commitments of leaders like Patrick Henry, who drafted a series of resolves in opposition to the Stamp Act in 1765, and Peyton Randolph and Thomas Jefferson, who helped to form the Intercolonial Committee of Correspondence in 1773, and who uh, and who supported Virginia's involvement in the First and Second Continental Congress. The decisions of these powerful men were de determinative. All belonged to the slave owning, slave owning class in Virginia. Patrick Henry was born to a prominent family, but as a younger son did not inherit its estate or the enslaved population that worked on it. Instead, he trained as a lawyer, married into a modest property with a small enslaved labor force and made his name in politics. Randolph was also trained as a lawyer and lived in Williamsburg, but he owned more than 100 enslaved people and became a major figure in Virginia before his death in 1775. Jefferson, too, was born into a wealthy family. His mother was a Randolph related to uh, Peyton. In, uh, Jefferson inherited a large estate, eventually came to own some 200 enslaved workers, and also studied law at the College of William, William and Mary. All three men and many of their fellow Virginians aspired to independence more than they feared the ability of their colonies enslaved population to turn their Republican ideas against them. I wanna just pause and emphasize though, at this point in the talk that much more could be said about the ways in which leaders strategized to police and suppress the activities of enslaved people in the independence era, especially in uh, Virginia and South Carolina who had a, uh, both had um, extensive experience with this, uh, with this process and with the danger of, uh, or the perceived danger of slave revolt. In taking a leadership role in the continent-wide continent resistance movement, men like these were instrumental in drawing along leaders from South Carolina and Georgia, the much smaller, newer colonies to their south, despite their vulnerability. Beyond these relatively well-established mainland colonies, the rest of British America remained too attached to the imperial system to participate. As I said earlier, either because they were too new and small to stand on their own, or because they were too valuable and too vulnerable to risk independence. The colony of Quebec is a special case, which I'll just mention briefly. After it was won from France in the Treaty of Paris of 1763, the British crown had been very good to Quebec. Advisors deliberated for more than a decade before Parliament passed the Quebec Act in 1774. This was a law that outraged many British colonists but fulfilled the fondest wishes of the Quebecois themselves. It allowed the Catholic Church to, to continue to function in the colony the way it always had. It ensured the security of land titles that had been granted under French law. And as you can see in the slide, it extended the boundary of the colony south all the way to the Ohio River. Most of Quebec's residents remained profoundly antagonistic toward their ang Anglophone neighbors to the South with, which, with whom they had been fighting wars for a century. Um, and the population simply did not share either the political traditions or the grievances that brought the 13 rebelling colonies together. The independence movements in Spanish America were fundamentally structurally different from the British case. And that difference mattered a great deal. I just wanna take a minute to describe the structural this difference. Though imperial, imperial reforms had triggered resistance movements in various places during the 18th century, Creole elites throughout Spanish America remained loyal to the crown. Two things happened to challenge that loyalty. First, during the Napoleonic Wars, the British Navy cut off Spain from its American colonies almost entirely for more than a decade from about 1796 to 1808. Then in 1808, Napoleon threw Spain's king, Ferdinand VII, off the throne and installed his brother Joseph as Spain's new monarch. 
This event triggered resistance, both in Spain and the colonies, but that resistance was initially loyal to the deposed King Ferdinand. Local juntas formed in Spain to resist the French takeover, and the same thing happened in the colonies. So the first extra legal political institutions in Spanish America were actually acting in support of the crown, not in opposition to it. From 1808 to 1820, Spain's fortunes were uncertain, and that did much to determine the course of events in the colonies. This structural reversal where the crisis that triggered independence occurred in Europe rather than the Americas means that Latin American independence proceeded very differently than it did in British North America. Nevertheless, the underlying calculus in the two cases was similar. In Latin America, as in the British colonies, Creole elites had to ask themselves how much they could risk in pursuing independence. Those colonies too fell along a spectrum. At one end were plantation colonies like Cuba and Puerto Rico, where landowning slaveholding elites relied heavily on their metropolitan connections and had much to fear from the chaos independence might unleash. Throughout the years of upheaval, when all the Spanish mainland colonies achieved independence, those island colonies remained loyal to their European parent country for the same reasons the other plantation colonies did. Independence would have cost those colonies most powerful men more than they were willing to risk, as the case of Haiti made all too clear. Though they were not plantation colonies, Mexico and Peru had key features in common with them. Both had very large Native American populations that immensely complicated the demographic and political configuration of the colonies. Indigenous communities had a recognized corporate identity within the colonial state that validated and to some extent protected their corporate community rights. They provided labor that was critical to the colonies they inhabited, and they were also an independent force in politics. The most striking example of indigenous power being expressed within a colonial state was the Tupac Amaru Rebellion in the central and southern Andes in the early 1780s which mobilized 300,000 people, most of them Native American or Mestizo, in response to tax reforms that had contributed to deteriorating economic and social conditions. There was no analog in British America to the large indigenous population that were such an important part of the colonial social order in Latin America, and especially in the imperial hearth, imperial hearth regions of Mesoamerica and the Andes. Nor was this the only important structural distinction that set Mexico and Peru apart. Britain was notoriously unable to confer much in the way of patronage, preferment, or metropolitan power to anybody residing in its colonies. The people who rose to the top of colonial society did so largely on their own initiative. And once there, the offices and institutions they controlled were local, not metropolitan. The case in the oldest parts of Latin America was very different. Here, Creole elites had been consolidating power based on their connections to metropolitan institutions for a long time. In Mexico City and Lima, for example, the historians James Lockhart and Stuart Schwartz have summarized the situation this way. Quoting now from Lockhart and Schwartz. By a careful allocation of roles among its members, manipulating marriages and inheritance, and using economic leverage, a great family would hope to end up with one senior member in charge of its large hacienda or collection of haciendas, another on the audiencia, one on the cathedral chapter, one in the militia, and so on, with the females married to men of allied similar families who were in yet other complementary positions and businesses. A fully successful family of this kind often bought a, a title of high nobility, marquis or the like, and established an entail to keep the family assets together. Such family strategies were common in British North America as well, but what was lacking there was the institutional infrastructure that linked metropolitan institutions to colonial aspirations. These Latin American families controlled vast estates then leveraged them to gain power in the nobility, the church, the militia, and the audiencia, and also in the corregimiento and the cabildo, which were administrative units below the level of the audiencia, but also linked to the crown. This kind of crown preferment was conspicuously absent in the British case, where metropolitan offices and titles might have done a great deal to dampen the conflicts that ultimately led to independence. <clears throat> 
Such political, economic, and cultural assets tied directly to Spain itself made the Creole elites of Spanish America's oldest colonies much more cautious about severing their transatlantic connection. This was true despite the fact that the economic ties between colonies and metropole were fraying badly. The old merchant guilds of Lima and Mexico City had long controlled the transatlantic trade, which was based on Spain's fleet system. By the later 18th century, that system had collapsed. It was replaced by a policy of free trade that often favored the interests of Spain's newer colonies and that helped their merchants forge commercial ties in the North Atlantic with Great Britain, France, and the Netherlands. Buenos Aires and Caracas, which were located in the new vice royalties of Rio de la Plata and New Granada, uh, respectively, uh, those two cities took the lead in this trade. They sold contraband silver, along with more prosaic goods like beef and leather, and they were prospering as these newly opening regions expanded. The new vice royalties had the same institutions that Mexico and Peru did, but what they lacked was a network of prominent families with deep roots in those institutions. Instead, the power of the Creole elites in these newer parts of mainland Spanish America was much more fully grounded in their achievements in the colonies, just as was the case in British North America. As a result of these differences, the cause of independence in South America was taken up initially on the geographical margins, then made its way in a war of liberation from the peripheries to the center. Peru was the last holdout in mainland uh, South America. This pattern, as Lockhart and Schwartz have noted, almost perfectly reverses the order in which the Spanish conquest originally occurred. One military expedition, which you can see uh, if you follow the arrow on the bottom of this slide, one expedition was led by Jose de San Martin, originating in Argentina, pushed west into Chile and then north along the coast to Lima, while at approximately the same time, another army led by Simon Bolivar took control of Venezuela and pushed west, first into New Granada and then south to Lima. For a time, Spain supplied troops to help suppress these campaigns, but from 1820 onward, instability at home prevented the king from supplying any more troops uh, for American campaigns. At that point, the remaining loyal resistance in the colonies was on its own. Peru was the last holdout on mainland South America. This reflected both the resistance of the Creole elite who controlled Lima, and also the challenge of gaining control of the large indigenous and mestizo population in the highlands. Peru was an old powerful colony, despite the economic inroads, especially in the silver trade that were centered in the Rio de la Plata region, Peru remained a wealthy place. It was divided between its Creole elites on the coast, uh, centered in and around Lima and a very large indigenous population that for all the changes wrought by colonization still inhabited communities steeped in tradition and structured, structured by native patterns of authority. Lima fell to San Martin in 1820 while Bolivar successfully pacified the highlands in 1825. In the end, the wars of liberation in South America resulted in the creation of three clusters of newly independent nations that, that, that I'm gonna focus on here for, for, this, uh, for the time being. Gran Colombia became Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. The vice royalty of Peru became Peru, Bolivia, and Chile. And the vice royalty of Rio de la Plata became Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. These wars were contests for geopolitical advantage, but they were also aspirational. They were driven by the hopeful prospect of liberated colonies united by common interests and a common vision of their collective future. Simon Bolivar is the most famous and foremost champion of this vision. Bolivar was no colonial upstart. He was a seventh generation member of an old and well-established Caracas family. Like many of his counterparts in British North America, Bolivar was steeped in the language of classical republicanism and often described the pursuit of independence in terms of a contest between liberty and virtue on the one hand and slavery and corruption on the other. For Bolivar, Latin American independence provided an opportunity to throw off the yoke of European imperialism while asserting the right of Creole elites to direct the creation of newly independent republics with their own imperial aspirations. Joshua Simon has described Bolivar's thought this way. 
Bolivar brought the framework, I'm quoting now from Joshua Simon, Bolivar brought the framework of classical republicanism to bear on the distinctive dilemmas arising in a Creole revolution. Using the tradition's concepts of freedom and citizenship, virtue and corruption, monarchy and mixed government to justify a rebellion against European rule that left Creole's ascendance within America undisturbed to design innovative constitutions meant to contain the potentially explosive caste conflicts and inherited imperial social hierarchy could produce after independence, and to assert and pursue power and influence for his new state within hemispheric and global affairs. Bolivar's military campaign for independence succeeded, but his plan to establish a large consolidated state of Gran Colombia eventually failed, and the union dissolved instead into several independent polities. In this respect, the outcome of independence in mainland South America is often contrasted with the path to independence that was followed by Great Britain's 13 breakaway colonies in North America, which after all remained united. And in key ways, the two outcomes were quite different. Perhaps most obviously, South America was larger. It was much more complex geographically with tropical lowlands, dense rainforests, towering mountain ranges, and the immensity of the Amazon basin. It was more than twice as populous as British North America, the, the, the revolting part of British North America. And it was more deeply rooted in the patterns of social and in, in its patterns of social and political development. But there were also important similarities between the South American case and the North American one. In both contexts, Creole elites managed wars of independence in a way that sought to preserve and extend their authority while implementing new forms of government that were premised on widespread popular participation. In some settings, like the former colonies of New England, the new Republican governments did not constitute such a great departure from the colonial charters they were replacing. Although it's worth noting that John Adams, the principal architect of the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, and ever afraid of too much democracy in government, actually increased the property requirements for voting and for office holding in the Massachusetts, uh, in Massachusetts um, from the stipulations of the colonial charter. So Massachusetts actually became somewhat less democratic as an independent state than it had been as a British colony. Other newly independent states in North America had much larger proportions of African-Americans in the population. Though the revolutionary generation recognized the incompatibility of chattel slavery with Republican principles, the institution came through the era of independence more firmly established than ever in the parts of the United States that relied most fundamentally upon it. In the South, the enslaved remained enslaved. Where Blacks were free, they were excluded from citizenship. And nowhere in British North America were Native American communities granted any kind of political standing. Instead, their claims were considered to be inferior to those of European descended polities, and they were expected to yield whenever there was a conflict. The new nations of South America had to negotiate a similar set of issues. Every new nation in South America became a republic. Each of them wrote a constitution. Each was deeply influenced by the political ideology of republicanism. And each had to debate and define the boundaries of citizenship. Creole leaders of the independence movements were initially inclined to exclude the enslaved, free black and mixed race populations that surrounded them from the privileges of citizenship. As military events unfolded, however, it quickly became clear that leaders like Bolivar and San Martin could not do without them, and they joined the armies in large numbers. The mass mobilization of free people of color and enslaved Africans resulted in the end of the caste regime and the immediate or gradual emancipation of enslaved persons throughout the continent. At the same time, however, key aspects of Latin America's social and economic hierarchies endured, just as they did in the United States, as each new nation went through its own process of debating, negotiating, and contesting a viable political settlement. While the United States and mainland South America offer, an in, offer instructive comparisons, the experiences of Mexico and Brazil highlight the essentially conservative character of well-established colonial regimes. Even more than Peru, Mexico was a colony of immense size. Its population of 5.8 million people was more than double that of all 13 colonies that became the United States combined. And it was also a colony of entrenched interests, much more than Peru, which suffered a great deal from the economic realignments of the 18th century, Mexico continued to, um, 
benefit and to grow economically, even as its ties to Spain were attenuated. Mexico had great landholders. It had old established merchants who belonged to traditional guilds and also newly wealthy merchants who benefited from the new North Atlantic trade. In Mexico City and its other urban centers, it had large and varied artisanal classes. In the countryside, many corporate indigenous communities continued to govern themselves according to pre-conquest traditions, while a very large mixed race population, including mestizos and people of African descent, performed a wide variety of labor in agriculture, mining, and urban employments. When a populist uprising led by a humble priest named Miguel Hidalgo threatened the social order in Mexico, a royal army led by Agustin de Turbide set out to pacify the countries, countryside. It soon became clear, however, that Spain was no longer able to support the institutions that the colony's Creole elites relied upon. Instead of crushing the rebellion, the Royal Army reconciled with the rebels in the countryside. And in 1821, the two forces together declared an independent Mexico to be ruled by a monarch, though there was no monarch immediately available. This was agreeable to all parties since the Creole elites imagined that their privileges would best be secured by such an arrangement, while the populists, many of them people of African and indigenous descent, believed that the new government would respond to their grievances. A year later, Iturbide was declared emperor and independence was complete. Brazil followed the most conservative path to independence of any American colony. When Napoleon's forces invaded Portugal in 1807, the royal family, the court, officers of the government and some 15,000 subjects got on ships and sailed for Rio de Janeiro where they established an independent Brazil under the heretofore Portuguese monarch Jean VI. When the king returned to Portugal in 1820 to restore the monarchy, he left his son Pedro on the throne in Brazil. The Portuguese parliament responded by negating Brazil's status as a co-equal monarchy and insisting that Pedro return and Brazil become a colony once again. Pedro defied the parliament, stayed put, and Brazil became a fully independent monarchy. Thus, Brazil alone avoided the kind of breakdown and dissolution that occurred everywhere else in the hemisphere. It was also the only former colony to become an independent monarchy. And its path towards social, economic, and political reform was the slowest anywhere in the Americas. Not until 1888 did Brazil abolish the institution of slavery, an initiative that was undertaken by the crown as a last desperate measure to retain power. That effort failed, the crown lost the support of the colony's slaveholders, and in 1889, Brazil too became a republic. In the interpretive tradition associated with R.R. R. Palmer, the American Revolution was the harbinger of the modern age, and modernity for Palmer meant the end of aristocratic privilege and the rise of more democratic forms of government. It is certainly correct that the Republican ideas of liberty and self-government served as a powerful example in Europe and throughout the Americas. It is also true that all the new American nations faced vexing challenges as they sought to throw off imperial rule and declare for self-government while preserving the social order they already had as much as possible. Joshua Simon has labeled these movements Creole revolutions and he describes their essential character this way. Quoting from Simon now, the institutions of European imperialism in the Americas placed Creoles in a difficult position. As the European inhabitants of American colonies, Creoles enjoyed many privileges, benefiting in particular from the economic exploitation and political exclusion of the large indigenous African and mixed race populations that lived in or near their colonies. However, as the American subjects of European empires, Creoles were also socially marginalized, denied equal representation in metropolitan institution, councils and parliaments, and subject to commercial policies designed to advance imperial interests at the colony's expense. Independence offered Creoles an escape from the vagaries of imperial domination, but posed a serious threat to the internal hierarchy of the colonies. So the political thinkers that organized and defended rebellions across the hemisphere were forced to confront a dilemma. How could they end European rule of the Americas without undermining Creole rule in the Americas? 
His response is that the leaders of colonial independence developed an ideology of anti-imperial imperialism, which rejected the legitimacy of European control in the Americas, while it also defended the claims of newly independent American states to their own imperial expansionist projects. To that end, they designed governments that combined democratic forms with powerful executives who were capable of acting decisively in the interests of these new states. Across the span of the 19th century, the new nation states of the Americas went through similar processes. They wrote constitutions, secured their borders, endured episodes of unrest, and struggled to define the boundaries of their political communities. Throughout the hemisphere, these processes were shaped by the legacies of colonization, which marked all the peoples and nations of the Americas in ways that remain with us to this day. Thanks very much for your attention. I believe Emily is gonna come back onto the screen now and I'll be happy to uh, take a few questions or have a little conversation in the time that's left. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Hinderocker. We do have uh, some questions. Uh, I'll take the first one from uh, Jeffrey here on Zoom. Uh, Jeffrey says, uh, Bolivar was not so much about independence, egalitarianism and liberty as about wanting his own empire. <laughs> Uh, is that a question? That's a, that's a question. <laughs> um, I mean, Bolivar is, is complicated, and he's complicated um, for various reasons, but one reason is because, um, you know, he was active for a long time, and so, you know, his, his, his writings are varied, and they evolved, and um, you can certainly, you know, draw, draw on different aspects of his thought to emphasize, and his writings to emphasize different things. Bolivar definitely had imperial aspirations, and that's part of the argument of this talk. I mean, the United States had imperial aspirations too, didn't it? I mean, all of these new American nations believed they had um, a different kind of legitimacy in the sphere of operations they were, they were operating in, in the Americas, right? And they saw themselves as um, agents for new kinds of empire, right? I mean, Jefferson called the United States the empire, an empire of liberty. And if you think about the Northwest Ordinance and if you observe um, what happened in North America, even just in the first you know, um, 20 or 30 years after uh, independence, um, you can see that imperial dynamic at work in, um, in the case of the United States. And the same thing was true for Creole elites in other parts of the, of the Americas, including Bolivar, yes, he was definitely an expo exponent of empire. And I mean, we can also talk about his, you know, um, you know, not only him, but, you know, for various people, you can talk about, you know, the desire for personal power and advancement. That's obviously, I mean, all of these people had um, significant ego investments in what they were doing. Um, so, yeah, I don't wanna, I don't wanna rely differences between, um, you know, South America and North America, what I wanna do is emphasize structural parallels. And um, because South America is a very different place from the 13 re rebelling colonies of British North America, its dynamics are different, um, right? Because the, the circumstances are different, but there is a logic um, that unites the two cases. And that's, and that's what I'm trying to emphasize in, in this particular uh, presentation. That's, uh, that's more focused on uh, the United States and North America. This also comes from Zoom. It says, do you not think the United States had its own aristocracy after independence, albeit informal compared to the English system? Yeah, I absolutely. And, you know, this is the thing that, um, you know, a big part of my argument is to stress that because we often think of the American Revolution as revolutionary, and, and it was revolutionary in important ways. That is to say, it initiated some fundamental changes in, um, you know, the nature of the political system and the social order. But Creole elites were very interested in, um, in preserving the power that they had, and they were pretty successful at it. Um, so when you use the phrase American aristocracy, what I would say is that there were, there were powerful families in the colonies before independence, and most of them retained their power after independence, um, but they weren't an aristocracy if we wanna talk formally, right? If they had been an aristocracy, that is to say, if they could have grounded their power and secured their power, stabilized their power through more robust connections with Great Britain, probably American independence, the logic of American independence would have looked different for them than it did, right? But all of their achievements, all of their 
wealth, all of their power was grounded in their colonial homes without the kind of, um, the kind of transatlantic ties that um, elites in Mexico and Peru particularly could rely upon to really solidify their um, social standing and their political authority. Wonderful. Well, uh, to kind of bring some of these threads together, and um, I think this is a good question to do that. Does it, do you feel that the way in which these revolutions unfolded um, have had effects on the different societal and, and political cultures that are still uh, present in these countries today? So what are the, the present day implications of, of this history? Of the, of the military, um, the, the kind of the course of military affairs specifically, um, I think that um, this is an interesting question. I, I think that, um, I mean, part of my argument here is that there, there is this continuity um, between the colonial order and the post-independence social order and political order. And I want to, you know, I, I, I don't want to deny the, the powerful effects of independence or of new political institutions, but I do, you know, one of the things I want to say is that there's this continuity that's really important to recognize. Um, I think it's interesting to, to, to think about the, the role of the war, of the wars themselves um, in national political cultures. If you think, I mean, for me, my, th my thought experiences, experiments with questions like this always start with the United States, right? Because it's what it's I'm most familiar with and I myself am a historian of British North America. But um, you know, if you think about the United States, the American Revolution is, um, has immense ideological and cultural significance. We invest it with a lot of um, you know, meaning and power, right? I mean, it is, the, it is the origin story of American national identity and it matters a lot to Americans, you know, how we think about people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and how we interpret the military experience of the war. I think the same thing is probably true in um, the nations of South America in ways that it's very hard for us to appreciate. But one of the things about, um, you know, in talking about the difficulty of establish, establishing even larger federal institutions in South America, you know, something like Bolivar's Gran Colombia. Um, one of the things Latin Americans talk about is the very deeply rooted sense of micro patriotism, right? That, that South American places had very strong senses of self identity that caused them to want to remain separate and independent um, in, in the face of these kind of um, grand federal, you know, these larger consolidating um, experiments. Um, they didn't want to empower, you know, somebody like Bolivar um, any more than necessary through, you know, some grand office running all of Grand Columbia or whatever. And so, you know, I think that probably the wars of, uh, of South American uh, independence have a similar kind of meaning, value, and power in the cultural memory of those nations, and that it's rooted in the ways in which these wars allowed um, the, the populations of these nations to affirm their identities, their collective identities, and to control um, their, their, their fates going forward. In connection with that, about this kind of a cultural identity specifically of countries in Latin America, you mentioned uh, the priest and the uprising in Mexico. Uh, what role did the, did the Catholic Church specifically play in revolution of countries in Latin America? Yeah, well, the Catholic Church, um, you know, for the most part in, especially in the oldest um, colonies in Mexico in particular, I mean, to just stick with that example, um, uh, Peru as well, but Mexico especially, um, was a very um, powerful conservative force. I mean, the Catholic Church um, in Mexico, uh, you know, penetrated indigenous communities and um, kind of co-opted uh, and adapted um, indigenous religious traditions to create a kind of indigenous Catholicism that was really important to the collective identity of a nation like Mex Mexico. It really, you know, was a connecting thread between the Creole elites in Mexico City and the um, and the um, indigenous indigenous communities in the countryside, and by and large, you know, the the Catholic Church was was not um, you know it was not a disruptive force. It was not agitating for change. Um, I mean, you know, the the 
the the story of the Mexican the, that populist uprising is a is a kind of counterexample of that, but that's not mm-hmm. the primary you know uh, kind of story of of the Catholic Church uh, in colonial Mexico and um, the continuity um, from the colonial period to the Indian independence period in in the power of the church is also a really important stabilizing force um, in in Mexican history, but 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 definitely a, a quite a conservative one. Um. We have uh, an unrelated question that's come in on, on Zoom, but something that the audience was curious about. What is the map on the wall uh, behind you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You know, um, I, I grew up in, in South Dakota, um, okay. not too far from where you all are if you're um, um, in Chicago, in the Chicagoland area. And so um, a friend in graduate school found this um, map in an antique store and uh, had it framed and gave it to me for my birthday, Michael Prokopow. Um, and um, it is a, a land speculation map from um, early uh, 20th century South Dakota um, with all kinds of very optimistic predictions, most of which I can say having grown up there did not come true. <laughs> but, uh, it's actually pretty fascinating to look at in particular to see um, all of the all the all the little townships represented, many of which are now gone. It's a more mm-hmm. densely, you know, it's it's a more densely uh, occupied map now than the same map, or, uh, densely occupied then than the same map would be now. Well, we have uh, just time for one more question, so I'll throw this one out. It's kind of a big one. Um, so, in the first version of the 1619 project, the argument was made that colonial slaveholders joined the revolution to protect the institution of slavery. Uh, what do you make of this assertion? Yeah, that's a that's really an interesting question, and and I think um, you know the 1619 project is a really interesting project, um, which I think in many ways is is laudable. I support um, the idea of trying to um, make the the le- the history and legacy of slavery a bigger part of the story of American history than it is for many people. This claim, however that um, slaveholders uh, joined the revolution because they thought the British empire was a threat to the institution of slavery in 1775 or whatever. This is an unsupportable argument. Um, you know, the, there is no question that um, for leaders in Virginia and South Carolina, it was a calculated risk to join the independence movement. Um, and they had to work hard to suppress slave rebellions. And um, in particular, you know, recent arguments about this have focused on the Dunmore Proclamation, so-called, of 1775. Governor Dunmore, you know, who um, who was the governor of Virginia and who um, offered freedom to any enslaved people who would join him and um, become part of his Ethiopian regiment of loyal supporters of the crown. Um, the idea that the Dunmore Proclamation was somehow a trigger to um, Virginian independence just gets the chronology totally wrong. From the beginning of the, of the um, independence movement, you know, or, or of the, I should say, the colonial resistance movement, Virginia was a leading force. You know, um, Patrick Henry drafted the most radical um, resolves in relation to the Stamp Act of, of anybody in any colony, and, and Virginia took the lead on protesting the Stamp Act. And, um, you know, Virginians were, as I said in the talk, you know, were instrumental in the creation of committees of correspondence. Dunmore's proclamation came in November of 1775. By that time, I mean, the revolution was always already effectively underway. In fact, Dunmore had to flee to, um, you know, to a ship in the, in the Chesapeake Bay and govern from the water because he was driven out of Williamsburg um, in the, um, in the, spring of of 1775. In June 1775, George Washington took command of the the Continental Army on, you know, the Cambridge Common in uh, in the Boston area. And so the idea that somehow Dunmore's kind of desperate rearguard proclamation of November 1775 was a trigger to the revolution is just false. It was it was a last desperate attempt for him to retain power and respond to a movement that was already well underway. And, and more generally, clearly, it was clearly understood by slaveholders throughout the Americas that Great Britain was no enemy of the institution of slavery. This subject had even been debated briefly in parliament and um, 
It wasn't that long after the American Revolution that uh, a really powerful um, emancipation movement uh, uh, arose in Great Britain and became a force in British politics. But in 1775, um, it, was, it was not on the horizon at all. Well, that's sadly all the time that we have today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hinderocker, for an illuminating lecture and to our audience for your thoughtful comments and questions. And again, our special thanks to the Society of Colonial Wars in the state of Illinois in partnership with the History Department at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign for sponsoring this program. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. If you missed any portion of today's lecture, a recording of this program will be available on the Newberry Library's YouTube channel. Newberry programs remain free and open to the public thanks to the generosity of our donors. During this critical time, we need the support of our entire community. Please support the Newberry Library by making a gift today. You can do so online at newberry.org forward slash give. And please join us for our next virtual program, a Meet the Author event for the book, Only the Clothes on Her Back, Clothing and, and the Hidden History of Power in the 19th Century United States. The author, Laura Edwards, will be in conversation with historian Margaret Story. The program takes place Tuesday, February 15th at 5 p.m. Central Time. Join our mailing list to be the first to hear about upcoming programs and other Newberry news. Sign up at newberry.org. Thank you and have a great weekend.